We're joined by Lionel of Lionel Media, constitutional lawyer, former prosecutor and defense attorney, TV and radio host. Follow him at Lionel Media, lionelmedia.com. He's an Emmy Award-winning television news decoder and legal analyst, licensed trial lawyer and former prosecutor. Again, he joins us now. I want to continue with your calls. He'll be with us the whole next hour. We'll intersperse calls with him, Ben, and uh, others that are patiently holding. The Greek situation, uh, the, the pulling down, the, the digging up of Confederate generals. Memphis mayor wants to literally dig up Confederate general and move him. Uh, citizens signing petitions to ban the American flag. I told you it's next. Just all this craziness, ISIS attacks. Where should we begin, Lionel? I mean, what's front and center on your radar? Do you want to speak to the balkanization of the generations and what I was just getting into? Because... They're getting us ready for another uh, round of being held hostage to these shadowy global banks. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements is going to say from a secret meeting what we do. They're our boss. How many more trillions of U.S. taxpayer money will go over to Europe to prop something up that's meant to fail? Sucker born every minute. I mean, where do we start, Lionel? You know, it's funny, uh, Alex. You, 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 you've, there, there's so much. Just listening on hold to being on hold is, is just enormous. You know, I, I cannot begin, first of all, without mentioning the role of the mainstream media as potentiating our delusion. You know, one of the problems they say with taking, let's say, diazepam and alcohol or mixing certain drugs is that alcohol potentiates certain drugs. Well, the media potentiate our ignorance. And what they do is like a baby bird is fed by its mother. The mother takes a worm, chews it, digests it, and then gives it back to the baby bird in a form the baby bird can handle based upon its own youth and based and novelty, in essence. Well, that's what our media are doing right now. With all that is going on in the world, here in New York, we had yesterday a gay, a gay pride day, which is terrific. And I think, very frankly, personally, everybody should be allowed to marry anybody they want who's an adult. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court case had nothing to do with that. It actually hurts the cause. And then we had recently, you probably haven't carried this, but here locally in New York, we have these the second of these escapees who was gunned down by the police. We're talking about that. And then we have the Confederate flag. Again, chewed up, predigested worms being fed to us by the media. And meanwhile, Alex, they look to Greece. And they say, you know, this is a rather arcane and recondite subject. Bonds and IMF and bailouts. And that's Greece. That's some third world Greece, the, the, the backbone of democracy. But that's Greece. It's never going to happen to us. I don't have time for that. I'd rather talk to about Caitlyn Jenner or Confederate flags. I'd rather take history, Alex, and revise it. I'd rather take a subject. Namely, Confederate flags. We've never talked about it. It's the perennial subject now, much like team mascots are, whether the Redskins is a racist term. And we just talk about it because it creates the delusion and the illusion and the perception that we're a part of something, that we're involved. When in fact, it's predigested nothing. Because the real issue, the real frightening things involve issues, Alex, that are too many people arcane and reckoned. That's right. It's cold-blooded, pre-planned diversion while earth-shattering huge events are taking place. Build up for war with Russia, global depression, bank runs. And then I hear this too. Why do I care about Greece? Well, because you're about to bail them out. Or right. why do I care about derivatives? Because you've been signed on to them. Or why do I care about the stock market? Because the company you work for is able to pay you because of stock. There's this super selfishness too built into the average person, not everybody, but a large portion, a large no, minority, everybody. where they think their selfishness is a shield, when in truth, it's that selfishness that brings them down. And I want you to speak to that, but separately, I'm a libertarian. So what does it really do if a bunch of trial lawyers now are going to be able to get, you know, two women or two men's money when they get in divorces with each other? Right. It's the fact of what is our gross demand? Uh, Domestic product, obsessing over the Redskins, obsessing over Confederate flags, right. obsessing over transgender people. When that's not our GDP, that's not, we used to be known for, for science, for developing things, for right. invention, for being trailblazers. They're giving us a mentally dysfunctional, 
balkanized fight with each other tower of babel that only only makes it worse it's so cold-blooded and, and you're a constitutional lawyer i don't know your view yet but i'll give you mine it's not the fed's place to be saying what the state should be doing concerning this and it's like all these other it's it's, it's like the fed saying states me, can't legalize marijuana it's the same me, deal let me ask you this alex let's assume that a state were to tell let's say the state of texas if you don't have a child within one year, let's say there's a law that's passed, you don't have a child within one year of your, of your marriage, of your nuptials, your marriage is therefore void. Because after all, marriage is about children. And if you're not having children, either because you elect to have children, you can't have children, you're too old to have children. I would say that's assume, wrong. And for those that don't right. know, it's already happening. Right. Well, guess what? You've just agreed to the federal government commenting on what is and isn't permissible under state law. You see, I believe in gay marriage, but I don't necessarily believe that this is the right vehicle. I believe a woman should have the right to an abortion. I'm sorry, but I don't think Roe against Wade is a way to do this. I think this fiction of privacy that Harry Blackman carved out of nowhere is a problem. Then you have this intellectually disingenuous nonsense, Alex. You have Justice Roberts, who the day before basically upheld Obamacare using, I don't even want to call it a fiction, with, with all due respect to fiction, but he used this unique aspect, this new vector of judicial activism to basically get, give a 6-3 majority for Obamacare. And then the next day, he railed against judicial activism, who said, how dare we, the Supreme Court, act as... Sure, well, undoubtedly, they use well, the gay marriage thing as a political football, a political toy to throw back and forth. But specifically on Obamacare, then, I mean, I'm no constitutional lawyer, but it's not equally applied uh, it's run by foreign groups to uh, it, it makes you buy a product. I mean, it's just the ultimate screw job and it sets the precedent on so many fronts. What is your view of Obamacare? Well, Obamacare under this, you, you see, well, let me let, let me let me go back. My view of Obamacare is one thing. The Constitution and the, the Supreme Court can be tailored to make anything fit. Anything. This idea that Scalia came up with that you could look through this prism of either judicial activism or or, or non-judicial activism, but originalism or strict construction. And you can apply this algorithm that gives you the correct constitutional interpretation is nonsense. The Constitution is so silent as to the Air Force, even how many justices there are in the Supreme Court. It can be anything you want. But you see, this has been portrayed to the American people, the theme as it's about freedom and love, and which is great, but you don't even need the Constitution to do that. Let me explain. In 1967, Alex, there was a case, Loving Against Texas, which basically um, overruled statutes, which made it a felony for there to be miscegenation, black and white people marrying. And they will often use that as an example to explicate, to, to, to bolster this decision that was different because that penalized people criminally for, for blacks and whites marrying, but not whites and Asians or any other race. It was a different vehicle. They missed the point. This past week, we have, and you were the one who, before anybody talked about this, let me just, I have to mention this, this horrible case of Charleston yet again. Alex, the thing to me that always is forgotten this is somewhat of a different subject, but not really. We will know everything about guns that were used, what he said, what he uttered, what he wore, what he Facebooked. We will never look at perhaps any type of psychotropic or psychiatric medication. This, to me, is absolutely uh, amazing in that it shows you how effete and how impuissant and how really a testicular if I, for lack of a better word, the trial lawyer's bar is because do you know what would happen if we could turn the issue of whether a known medication that is in the public commerce was responsible for taking otherwise normal people and making them homicidal? This would be a product's liability uh, a boondoggle the likes of which you've never seen exactly yeah. but they want to blame the guns so there is a mainstream media conspiracy of silence by omitting the truth but getting back to the whole so, supreme court issue i mean 
I think what you're getting at here, and I agree with it, is the government shouldn't be involved in the institution of religion, uh, First Amendment. It shouldn't be involved in the First Amendment because it has no jurisdiction. No. And it shouldn't be involved with who you live with or who you marry. Clearly, it's unconstitutional. It's not the jurisdiction, in my view, of the federal government to even be involved in it. Is that an accurate statement in your view? Absolutely. In the state of New York, where I am right now, first cousins can marry. In the state of New York... A person can marry his adopted child. Now, those are the laws of New York. New York, for better or for worse, decided we're going to do this. Texas may allow the age of 16. Virginia may allow 14. You may have a variety of parameters that the people of a particular state find to be within the, the, the rubric of what and that's why we is. have states, and it gives you choice, and if you don't like it, move to another state. Now, Precisely. why even have states with this big imperial government floating around, and then it takes its orders from secret bodies like the TPP. I want to come back, Lionel, get your take on the TPP. I want to talk to AD uh, and uh, some of the other callers, Wild, Matthew, Jason, Dwight, and others that are holding. We'll be right back with Lionel from LionelMedia.com. Don't forget, we've already sold out of Liver Shield, Occupower, Child Ease, and Prostagard. Some of these will be eight weeks till we get them back. So it's not a gimmick when I say we're about to sell out a survival shield, Mason Iodine, that's done so much for me and others. You've heard what it does. The good halogen. So many people are deficient. InfoWarsLife.com and purchase of that product funds our operation. And we've still got six other products that haven't sold out that are excellent as well at InfoWarsLife.com. And your funding helps fund this operation. PrisonPlanet.tv for the nightly news as well. We're going to talk economy and what's happening in Greece. Lionel, constitutional lawyer, Lionel Media. Media analyst. We're going to talk to AD and others coming up in the next segment. Then we'll shift gears after we take calls and get back into this whole Confederate flag situation, which is the biggest waving a red flag in front of a bull I've ever seen. I mean, this is just classic. To now, the Memphis mayor wants to literally dig up Confederate general and move him. This is just getting where you're just obsessed and offended by everything. And people don't even know historically what the context is. This is the rise of the total idiots. Like Mark Dice talked to 10 people and seven of them signed a petition to ban the American flag and change it to an all-seeing eye pyramid. This is the triumph of mind control, where people are illiterate about everything. Reading, writing, arithmetic, history, social skills, talking but they know how to get obsessed and what to be offended by. And it's all phantoms while they're being conquered. Lionel, TPP, is this not one of the most naked examples of a secret body that we're not allowed to see? Part of it leaks, totally draconian, bipartisan, right. they pass it. And now Obama is going to be coming back with his fast-tracked initiative uh, to a foreign body, and we don't even know everything that's going on in it. I mean, this, this this is really incredible. You know, Alex, that the word fast track, I think, is often misunderstood by people as meaning effective and efficient and quick. You know, when $29 million or so was fast track to individuals in Charleston, no, they, they say, great. No, no, fast track is a euphemism. It means, in essence, a non-review, something that is not subject to review or or um, inspection. Now, what, what people don't understand, and, and you said this initially, was the word globalism sounds good. It sounds terrific. It sounds like, oh, that's wonderful. We are the world. Remember that? I like to teach the world to sing. Kumbaya, let's hold hands. What we're talking about is a reconfiguration of the world. I don't have to tell you this. Into this unipolar world. <clears throat> this is beyond, let me be frank with you. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to say this. The American people, by and large, are great people but stupid, illiterate, not very bright, not very educated, great on sports, great on issues that don't matter, great on pop culture, great on a lot of stuff. But when it comes to being able to understand what it is that is critical to their survival, absolutely not a clue. I'm sorry to say this. I'm sorry to break the news to you, but we are absolutely mind-bogglingly demented when it comes to being able to recognize this. I don't understand 
why people don't under don't get the fact that what we're seeing is a reconfiguration, a reconsolidation, a a reestablishment of the world. You know, Alex, you've said new world order to the point where I think people don't really understand it. I think they have habituated to it. I think they have been conditioned to this term as some kind of weird conspiratorial phrase or shibboleth that you use that is somehow doesn't mean anything. We're talking about taking everything that we know, our jurisdiction, our country, and turning it into basically a member state of a world organization where the president of the United States isn't the leader of the free world, but basically we're the enforcer. We're the Luca Brasi. We back up either NATO or central banks and the like. And this, right off the bat, what I've just said, and you understand it, your listeners understand it, but for most American people, I'm sorry, they will scratch their head and say, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I do know my flags, and I do know Caitlyn Jenner, and I know sports. I'm sorry, Alex, but that's who we are. The United States of the illiterate. That is the best three minutes I've heard hands down describing the TPP. It is a total takeover. Puts all of our laws and rights into a shadowy secret offshore corporate fascist combine so they can do to us what they've done to Greece. Well said, Lionel. Playground was 200 feet away from her home with an eyesight. We all under about the age 50 or so. Or I'd say everybody above the age of 30. Grew up being able to go outside and play. Or grew up even in the city, people send seven, eight, nine year olds out to go get them a carton of milk at the corner store. Kids had to be able to learn how to follow orders, how to not walk in the street, how to cross the street when the light turned green, how to look both ways. And so if you're above about the age 30, you grew up in a world where you had the basic freedom of movement. But this latest article is nothing compared to the one two weeks ago where the 11 year old, his parents didn't get home till six, he got home at 4, 4.30, was playing basketball in the cyclone-fenced backyard and they saw him playing alone and a neighbor called and the police came and they charged the parents with endangerment. She took it to court and barely beat it. But since when did it become the law that you couldn't play outside? Well, there is no law. They can say that we interpret this as endangerment. Well, a jury's going to find if you give a bucket of hydrofluorosilicic acid or some other deadly acid to a seven-year-old and tell him to go out and play on the street with it, that it's beyond child endangerment. It's attempted murder because you could reasonably think they're going to get killed or blinded with this. But it is the established activity of humans for children to play outside. But see, it's the triumph of ignorance. There is the perception that gun crime's up, even though it's down between 50 and 60% since 1992, Justice Department's own numbers. That's not even debated. There is the perception there are more shark attacks, even though they're actually down. There is the perception that there's all this rampant racism. All of this is the triumph of hype. And I want to get into the economy and take your phone calls. But during the break, I was reading this article again where the police and the prosecutors with a straight face go, yes, this was very dangerous. And I even looked up the area. It's a nice area. But so what if your seven-year-old's playing in the park across the street and you're watching them? Let them. That's a parent's decision. That's why Texas is a Baptist state, super conservative, but... You can give your five-year-old a drink of your beer, you can buy him a beer. It's up to the establishment owners, again, business owners' rights, to refuse to sell you that wine or beer for your small child. In Europe, they give their kids watered-down beer and wine. The point is, is that it's still the law in Texas. You can go in and order your child a beer in a super conservative state because they understood you take parental rights away, you lose everything. It's up to a parent's decision. 
now if you've got your child playing with what you know is a say dysfunctional firearm they don't have firearms training and they're in their backyard with it that is child endangerment but is it child endangerment they're now trying to pass laws to say giving anyone under the age of 10 a bb gun the problem is the children are out of control they've never been in the real world they don't know how to tie their shoelaces figuratively they play video games all day the studies show they're becoming brain damaged from it they don't even have language anymore my dad's dad knew how to fix anything and knew how to do accounting and play golf and square dance at the same time. The point is he was a man. He could do it all. My dad, though, was a specialist. He went to college, became a chemist and a doctor. He still knows probably, let's not exaggerate, 10 times more than I do about fixing things. Not as much as his dad. Then there's me. I don't know that much, but compared to most men that are 41, I know a lot. Most men I know now can't change a tire under the age of 40. And they're making the cars now where if you put a battery in, say in a Volkswagen, it sends you a message and turns the battery off because you didn't go to their dealership and pay extra for one. That's the smart cars where everything's wired. They're building a world where we're basket cases. And our guest beautifully said that earlier, Lionel. When he talked about we're obsessed with everything that doesn't matter, everything that can't feed us, everything that can't teach us how to be competent, rebel flags and Caitlyn Jenner. But we don't know all the basics. This is the plan, and now we're watching the exact playbook. The IMF and World Bank fronts for private banks. IMF and World Bank's just the Federal Reserve's name worldwide. Same European banks own it. They are now imploding Greece with the same program, convincing the world that most of it is Greek debt when 92% of it is not, just like Iceland. Iceland, though, arrested their head bankers, went into all the documents and said, in their case, 93% of this is not our debt. We'll pay the 7% that's national debt. The 93 that's derivatives, we're not doing it. England put them on a terror watch list. Every Icelander, 400,000 of them, they had to back off when it came out. It was British banks involved. So they're going to try to do this. Imagine when they have a cashless society. That's my rant. We're going to get Lionel's rant. Then we're going to A.D., Wild. Uh, Dwight and others. Go ahead, Lionel. Alex, I've got to tell you this. In fact, I've wanted to say this for a long time. When I was a prosecutor, the area that I found the most problematic was doing dependencies in the juvenile system. And specifically, I used to deal with termination of parental rights, TPR. And what happened was the state of Florida at the time would come in and say that if you could show that a child was either abused, abandoned, or neglected, depending upon the standard, which nobody could really tell me, You'd go before a judge, and a judge would remove a child, disentangle, disengorge, like conjoined twins, a child with its parents. And what nature gave you, a court would separate that. And what was interesting was that they would take these poor people who might not have been, and they were poor. They might not have been the smartest. They might not have been educated. They had a hard time with schedules. But they were the parents. And they would have a mother, let's say, go to parenting classes or learn about something. Somebody would pick up a phone, drop a dime on a neighbor. And my favorite was failure to thrive. You know, the Jones kid, he has a son who doesn't look like he's growing as much as the others. Something's wrong, something's strange. And then they would call an overworked, underpaid, 20-year-old caseworker who knew nothing about raising kids, who was so afraid of perhaps signing off and being the negligent caseworker who let little Alex go to his death, that they would leap on this family, overreact, and then you are doomed. And then they would take this poor parent and they say, you know what, Mrs. Jones, because you didn't go to your parenting classes, because you didn't follow this set of instructions, which we think you need to know as a parent. And now little Alex has been placed in foster care with this rich family, with a lot of cool toys and a lot of neat stuff for such a long period of time that we think it would be unfair to return Alex from this very nice family who might want to adopt him back to you in your trailer and your squalor and this hovel. And I, Alex, murder cases didn't bother me. I shouldn't say that they bothered me, but nothing caused me to lose sleep, to realize that I was a part of a system that could take a child, think about this, 
Forget divorce. Divorce is horrible enough, but you are still the parent. And you might not be married, but it's two people who kind of sort of agree. But just imagine the power of the state of Texas or Florida saying that your child, by virtue of edict, by virtue of judicial fiat, is not yours anymore, cannot take under your will. You have no authority. Goodbye. And imagine this happens every single day. And nobody can tell you, Alex, if you called up a police officer and said, listen, I want to show my son how to use weapons. Can you tell me what to do? No. You give me guidelines. No. I want to spank my child, but I want to do it the right way. Can you tell me what is and isn't acceptable? No. I want to put my child on a vegan diet or a macrobiotic diet, or I'm against circumcision, or I'm against this medication, or I'm whatever. Can you tell me what is okay? So no, they I won't. It's all they nebulous can. so they can do whatever they want. And it all began with saying parents needed the state to come in. And then once you've destroyed the role of the parents, they can take everybody's kids, or you're just basically a babysitter. You follow what the government system says for your children, or they'll be taken. And the next shoe to drop is inoculate or we're going to take your children. It's already begun outside of law by projecting neglect onto it as Melissa Harris, Perry, and MSNBC have wanted. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. And that's central right there because to decode this, when you get involved with the, because I've covered this as well, and I got to where I couldn't cover it back when I was a local reporter because these were good families they were taking kids from. These are people who hadn't done oh, anything. Yeah. And I knew it was because it was a good kid that was two years old or a year old, and they could get a half million dollars in the uh, racket for rich parents that didn't know what was going on, you know, to get it. You know, some trophy wife who can't have kids and some guy that's worth $50 million. That's who they were really targeting was the good families in many cases to get those premium, quote, children. And to see it, it was so so incredibly sick and then all the social workers and lawyers and cops were doing was trying to cover their butts to go along with the system it is unbelievable and alex you know one of the things that you got to realize or people have to realize is that you have people who are untrained i got to tell you this one story stay there I had a i'm going to come back we got to go to break can't skip another break and then i'm going to let you finish that story i'll be with us the rest of the hour and then ad and uh, Dwight, Wild, Matthew, Jason, we're going to go to all of you on the situation in Greece. So don't hang up. I want to get to all of you. But Lionel's always got fascinating takes on everything, uh, especially with his prosecutor history. As if My mother never calls me during the show. I mean, maybe once every two years. She sent me a text message. She's listening, and she says, I've been listening for over an hour. No discussion of Puerto Rico saying they're going to default on their sovereign bonds. We did cover it the first hour, Mother. But yes, and, and she finished the text message with, this is a big deal. We are going to go to the calls. We are going to get into this. You know, there's a problem there, Lionel. I've been so close to this so long that as it all starts to happen, I, I, I'm not making the big deal out of it. I should be. I mean, I'm accused of being an alarmist. I'm kind of like an alarmist before it happens. You know, once it all happens, then I'm kind of just, well, here it is. Uh, but it's very disgusting. I want to get to that in a moment, but, but finishing up, with what's changed is the feds and the guidelines and the college teaching says it's abuse and neglect if kids are playing the park across the street and you've got tattletale neighbors that start the chain reaction where the police are worried about liability if they don't respond and the kid gets hurt. What's changed is we're a nation of bizarre cowards that are afraid to even come out of our houses. We've been domesticated. How do we reverse that, Lionel? Let me tell you, well, you, we, we need a revolution. Well, let me tell you something, Alex. If somebody picks up the phone and drops a dime on you and your wife, and you all of a sudden, the Jones family is on the hit parade, uh, you, you can't get your name off it. It's not like when you're arrested, you can seal it. It's there. And it's an administrative record. You say, excuse me, this was unfounded, this particular case. I need licensure in the, in, in the coming future. I'm having insurance problems. I want to be, a, let's say, a foster parent myself. Can you remove this report, even though it was unfounded? I'm sorry, you can't. And by the way, Alex, um, I mean, if, if I could, at Lionel Media, my Twitter feed, which I blurred out memes all day long, 
I talked about this, this one time, which really got people's attention. This is a true story. Little girl was at a school. She falls down. She goes to the nurse. The nurse looks her just to make sure she's okay. They take off her, her shirt and they see bruises. Oh, bruises. So immediately the teacher freaking out saying, I don't want to be responsible for not reporting it. She calls CPS. CPS sends over a 20 something who's again, overworked, underpaid. And Alex, so help me God, this 20 something turns to this kid and says, does your daddy ever touch you down there? It was a single parent. Where that came from, I have no idea. Did your dad, does your daddy touch you there? He said, yes. That was it. When? She said, after my bath. He said, aha, ritualized. You know what it turned out to be? And thousands of dollars and embarrassment later, he had to apply an ointment for someone to the doctor for some type of vaginitis or something. And it said, after a bath. Now, when you are put in the position, Alex, and imagine all the enemies that you have and people that you don't like, but when you are even into that, as far as being a part of child abuse or child sexual misadventure, the stigma sticks forever. And you can't. And it's all because it. of the ninnying. It's, it, it's like yes. the famous cases of Walmart and others where it showed the mom and the dad with their two girls. They each had a towel over them and they were hugging them and they had towels on them and they were calling it pedophilia. When real pedophilia is going on, nobody's getting in trouble half the time. And then meanwhile, the photo came out on the news, like on ABC News, and it was nothing. But Walmart wanted to protect itself, or Eckerd's. I mean, it's happened with all of them. Right. And, and, and so they call in the police who then act like it's real and legitimate. We've got to go to break, and then I promise, or they can punch me in the nose, I'm going to A.D. Matthew Wild, Jason Dwight, on the economy. And I should have done this the whole show. I know you would want to talk about that as well. As we go out to break, let's start talking about this now. How big a deal is it? Because we know the economy is untenable. We know the debts are untenable. But we've been signed on to the derivatives is the main reason we're untenable. Uh, they raised taxes so much in Greece that less money came in. Now they want more taxes raised. And people say, IMF, you're not stupid. Why are you doing this? Because they want them to become fully bankrupt and fully conquered. But what do you make of Puerto Rico? New York Times, Puerto Rico's governor says he'll need to pull the island out of a death spiral has concluded that the Commonwealth cannot pay its 72 billion in debts and administration will probably have wide ranging financial repercussions. I mean, this, this is the 51st state right there, bro. Alex, let me put it to you this way. Let me ask you this question. If you wanted to be the most powerful person on the planet and you wanted to destroy a country, how would you do it? I'd do it with an economic takeover buying off the ministers. Exactly. I would not fire a weapon. I would not send in a troop. Stay I there, explain this when we come back. The secret to ruling the world with Lionel, LionelMedia.com. I'm Alex Jones, InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. And I'm glad my mom texted me because, uh, you know, she, she, every two years she might call. <laughs> One time Charlie Sheen was on Melting Down, that famous deal. She called up and she said, stop this right now. This is not what your show is about. Shut it off now. And, of course, I didn't. Should have listened to her. We're on the march. That certainly is a very apropos way of putting it. Lionel, a uh, former defense lawyer and prosecutor, TV uh, critic, radio host, one of the top 100 talkers in the country, according to Talkers Magazine. Uh, he joins us. I, I met him years ago, and I was in the keynote address at a Talkers in New York, where he was the master of ceremonies. And I don't even agree with, you know, maybe 10% of what he has to say, but I, I get his perspective on the 10% I don't agree with. But on the other 90, he has a great way of putting things, a lot of good uh, stories and anecdotes. Without further ado, I want to go to AD and others that have been patiently holding, but I wanted to give you a chance because you got cut off by the break. Some people spend this over the years and say, you say the debt's too big and that it's untenable because you want confidence to be lost. And if people listen to you, we're going to go under. And I'm like, uh, no, uh, if we have you know two quadrillion plus in derivatives that aren't our debt that these big six mega banks created and have signed us on to, and if they keep raising taxes when they know at a certain point it hurts tax receipts, and we know the philosophy is to consolidate control, you were getting to that point, so restart with how do you conquer a country, this is what they admit they're doing. Everybody from Henry Kissinger to, to Brzezina Brzezinski to just all of them wrote books bragging how they're conquering the world. There's a reason when Brzezina Brzezinski or Henry Kissinger or David Rockefeller shows up and the Saudi princes are bowing to them, not the other way around, then Obama bows to them. I mean, these guys really did 
set up our modern world, and it's not pretty. And now they're getting ready to take down, because they've already taken over the world. They don't need the West anymore to take over the world under other guises, democratizing, humanitarian, whatever. Now they're in their end game. Radicalism will take over the Middle East and Africa, financial implosion in Europe. They've already taken over Latin America. I mean, I know the history of Latin America, a gestalt of it. And how, even though it had a history of sugarcane slaves and others that came there and natives that didn't know how to fight back against it and colonialism, after they got out from under colonialism for a while, in five or six spots, they were booming. They were free market. They were as rich as we were. They were inventing stuff. It'd be so cool if I could move to Chile or Argentina when I was old. It's beautiful down there. It'd be so cool to have other free countries. I look around, there's nowhere for me to run. I mean, I'll be honest, if there was some really cool free place, I'd get out of here. Uh, I mean, I love America, but man, I'm telling you, the people are so dumbed down. On average, the awake people are the salt of the earth. We've been an exceptional country. No one, I mean, I was at my cousin's uh, wedding reception at the Kalamazoo Air Museum. The pictures do not do it justice. And the reception at night with a great DJ and dancing was underneath the SR-71 Blackbird. They had prototypes in the 50s. It officially started flying in 63, like the B-2 bomber officially started flying in 87. It was flying around the 70s. Really flies like Mach 5, Mach 6. They, you know, the Russians had jets that would go Mach 3 and missiles that would go Mach 4.5, and they couldn't shoot it down. It's because it goes faster than Mach 3, boys. And they tell us this is still the fastest plane in the world. And my table was right under its nose. And I looked at how science fiction-esque it looked with the uh, cockpits forward and back. It, it's just amazing, our, our technology. I mean, countries can't build this today, okay? And different groups have different flares. You know, we can't build rockets like the Russians. They can't build stealth aircraft. But, I mean, I look at America, what we become, it's a joke. And we have to admit we're a joke. It's like if I woke up in a ditch with vomit all over me, I've hit rock bottom. I haven't actually done that, but you get my point. If I wake up, don't know where I've been for three days like the hangover, might be a good time to stop. And I, I just, we're a joke, people. Watching people savor, oh, let's dig up Confederate generals. Yes, yes. I mean, it, it's mental illness. All right, I'm ranting. Get into your point in the economy that I'm going to the calls. Well, Alex, you know, it's funny that you say this. I look out my window and I can look and I see the Intrepid right there on the Hudson River. And there's an SR-371 or 71 right there. And I see this thing every single day. And I'm thinking to myself, this was a time where we had enemies that were tenable and palpable and real. They weren't theoretical. They were actual enemies. It was the last time that the government, that our country really stood for something where we were fighting actual real enemies. And you can argue about how we got into Pearl Harbor. But, you know, Alex, you mentioned something before, which is interesting about history, and that it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Tolstoy said the greatest piece ever on this subject, and that is that history would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. Yeah. And what we believe to be history does not exist. Now, if I were going to destroy this country, here's what I would do. First and foremost, I would distract with bread and circuses the people more than ever. Number two, I would have as a foundation for much of the economy this tissue-thin veneer, this lattice work of cotton candy of air called the derivative. You say one and a half, maybe two, could be four or five quadrillion dollars of nothing. Then I would throw in the myth, Alex, of American exceptionalism. I would always have the flag and Lee Greenwood and John Wayne and Ronald Reagan and Fox News and we're the great, we are impenetrable. We are never going to be Puerto Rico or Greece or Iceland or Portugal or the EU. We're the United States. We are immunized. We have a vaccine against this. That's what will doom us. The idea, because Alex, this is a beta test. There, everything happens in Europe and those parts of the world first. And then we catch, they sneeze, we catch the oh, you're right. The IMF on. and World Bank admits that, okay, we've taken out Africa and Latin America. Now we're going to move on to Western countries, and they're doing it. And the only country to say no was Iceland. And they went in, they arrested the people, and found out, guess what? It wasn't even their debt.
And I'm going to also go in, Alex, and I'm going to fool people. For example, I'm going to tell people that there are new currencies of war, a new casus belli. I'm not going to let them know about water. I'm not going to ever let them know that we went into Libya over water. That's right. And the Nubian sandstone aquifer. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to ever let people understand that what and who runs the world are a very small group of central banks and very, very, uh, at the top of the pyramid, these elite banksters and elite All there is is mega banks, big energy, and weapons. And all we're going to do is we're going to create fictions and bad guys through ISIS. And then we're going to confuse people. We're going to cause the American people to be always upset over something and fool them and dupe them into thinking that they're involved. We're going to let them think that there's some Confederate war flag or battle flag controversy. We're going to also throw it. We're going to have a country that knows more about the physics of footballs and deflate gate than they do the rudiments and abecedarian aspects of our economy. We're going to have people who are so brain dead and narcotized voluntarily and through this, Alex, through this individual hypnotic sense of selfishness. We're going to turn everything That's into right. a selfie. We're then going to turn and remove them from individual interaction and caring and being global and being connected. Because, Alex, one day people are going to say, and you ask them, where are you? Where do you live? You're not going to say, I'm a proud Texan. They're going to say, I live here. This is where I My live. My smartphone. My smartphone. And because of this systemic, continued habituation, this organic dulling down, I'm going to then, as everybody is being distracted by the three-card Monty of the economic downturn, while we're looking this way, I'm going to little by little take everything from this country. And then one day, before you know it, it's going to be, it, it, it'll start maybe with a rumbling. It'll start and we'll start to see the initial threads, the initial tremors of a financial collapse. And the very people who run the world are so thrilled because they crave and they thrive on disorder and disaster. That's why when there's racial disharmony, when there's crime, when there's people in the streets, when we turn to the government in the Hegelian dialectic, this classic, wonderful progression, and we say more control, more, more power, more authority, then one day it's over. And your tombstone, your words, your final valedictory, Alex, sad to say will be, I told you so. You thought I was just somebody who was a conspiracy theorist. It's going to be too late. You thought I was doing this just for some kind of an act. You didn't realize that what I was saying and what the world was saying was there the whole time. And you didn't listen to me. And I told you. And I tried to make it as simple as possible. And I brought in guests to try to explain it in different ways. A Max Kaiser, a Salenti, a Paul K. Roberts, uh, a Paul Watson. And you, you, you've tried so hard. And you know, Alex, the thing that is the most important is that I don't know which vector I'm being hit with every single day. You wake up and you feel okay, and then you start to look at the news and you say, my God, where, where do I start today? And that's what, what they want. They want to overwhelm us. But at the same time, we've just got to realize it is the animating contest. Since studies show that old plants won't grow, there's not some wind, some rain, something pushing them. The reason we're so weak is we've been hiding from responsibilities. Well, that's why, you know, if you live a sedentary lifestyle, you die when you're 40, not when you're 90. We need to go out and fight this corruption and become aware of it, and that will turn the tide. But hey, this is the best interview ever with you, Lionel. I want to go to calls, but the way you crystallized, you know, the TPP in three minutes, the way in the last six, seven, eight minutes you crystallized, if I was the enemy of free humanity or if I wanted to destroy a free country, this is how I would do it, uh, or the plan to destroy a free people, you have done it. You've really laid it out. You can see how they've put us in a virtual reality of mainstream media and, and selfies and iPhones while they're stealing the real world around us. And it's not to conquer it so they can manage it better. They've decided to get rid of humanity. All right, AD, you're a real trooper. And then Dwight and all the rest of these troopers, thank you for holding. I really want to hear what you have to say on the economy, on Puerto Rico, getting ready to go bankrupt, uh, on 
Uh, Greece getting ready to go bankrupt, maneuvered into it by design. Uh, the media all calling them lazy. They deserve it. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, you know, Obama saying uh, just because you raise the debt limit doesn't mean you've raised the debt. This is, again, upside down, opposite world. Uh, you didn't build your business, but the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus are real. Uh, A.D. in Delaware, you're on the air. Thank you. Well, I got to tell you, Alex, after 10 years of you teaching me everything I needed to know, uh, on anal analyzing these idiots, um, you know, I've, I've formed an amalgam of algorithm analytics, which really does uh, point out their agenda atrocity and the bait and switch brain flooding that they like to run on the American people in Operation Mockingbird, which is really what your television is called. Um, we're seeing the guys from Operation Paperclip popping up like whack-a-mole. That scares me with Kissinger and Brzezinski running around, hanging out with Bush, wearing tuxedos, and they're on their fifth or sixth heart transplant. It all spells the annihilation of the United States. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the toilet paper policy, which means we will have none, basically is the spike in the last barrel of sustenance that this country has held out on while they lit the fuse. We are the dynamite, and the fuse is burnt through Europe. It's burned through the Ukraine and thereafter. I really believe, Alex, we're leading up to a bait and switch. In other words, uh, he is the Manchurian candidate. Obama is a fake and a hologram. Uh, he's destroyed everything. I'm hearing talk of Russia being set up to attack America as they run to their bunkers, and they will use a bioweapon this time. And I kind of believe it, Alex. All right. I'm going to have you comment again because you've been holding so long. But going back to Lionel, Lionel, all I know is I've always had a sense of urgency because I knew we needed to start reversing militarization of police, all of it, because it was part of a larger plan. N now, the establishment, it's in the Guardian, it's all over the news, are building bunkers, are building secret airstrips. They are bugging out of major cities. Maybe it's not this year, next year. I hope it never happens. Let's be clear. I'm not Nero all Rome berms, but there does seem to be an urgency in the establishment itself. More and more indicators. We know we're sitting on a house of cards. What does your gut tell you and what do other folks oh. in New York tell you? You know, it's funny you say that. Remember, you remember, Alex, when there was a tsunami and people suggested that uh, there was not one elephant that was found dead. The theory is that if you notice elephants starting to move inland and animals, and you see those people who are responding on frequencies that we don't, pay attention to that. When the elite, when the uber rich, and by the way, I love these people that I know who think they're rich. They may have a million or two, they're not even in, we're not talking about necessarily monetary rich, but when these people are sounding the alarm, when they're quietly disintegrating or disengaging themselves from that which is American, and they're moving like, who is it, uh, the fellow who's uh, from, um, uh, oh God, the famous Cameron, who's going to New Zealand and others, what does that tell you? What does that mean when you're finding dual citizenships and the like? Look. The bottom line is that we have never seen anything like this in the history of the world where we are going more and more towards a unipolar world. Putin talked about this. Look at how we are going to Putin and others and sticking a thumb in his eye and basically saying, come on, bring it on. There are people, Alex, who want there to be a world on fire. When there is calamity, when there is mayhem, when there is entropy, when there is disaster, then they can buy things on a fire sale. This is when they're the happiest. This is, remember, if Greece fails, who was it, Forbes who said this? How would you like to buy the Parthenon on a song? When a country collapses and they turn to say, help us out, who are the people helping you out? Alex, if you and I were the kings of the world, we would be high-fiving each other. We would go and we would say to these countries, we'll help you out, but it will be for a cost. And then little right. by little, our different unions, our different groups, we consolidate. And all of a sudden, what's missing? Jurisdiction, monetary systems, nationality, and all of the hints were there. 
from SPP to TPP to SOPA to CISPA, from every vector and angle you could imagine, from intellectual property to actual trade agreements. And we must master, and the elites have mastered, the art of the euphemism. It's a trade agreement. It's a world. It's a fast track. It's a smartphone. Yes. Speed, fast track, efficient, smart, beyond the grid. Patriot Act, affordable exactly. care. No child left behind. I mean, you can't, the better the word, there's an inverse proportionality between the, the, the harmlessness of the word or the legislation. That's right. Stay there. AD, thing. one final comment, then uh, Dwight. That shows you just how arrogant the elites are. We know they've been funding our enemies for a long time. It's not like they created some group that got out of hand. No, no, I mean, it was created to do this. And they're saying, brace for imminent attacks, but don't worry, we'll take all your rights away to keep you safe. I'm going to do some overdrive here so we can finish up with AD and who's been holding longer. Matthew, uh, Dwight, Wild. I'm going to try to get to everybody. Jason, uh, Lionel's our guest. Just briefly, because this is how I fund my operation. We have a lot of really great products at InfoWarsStore.com, books, videos, Patriot t-shirts to help spread the word. 25% off right now on all the Molon Labe come and take it belt buckles. We've sold out a liver shield, OccuPower, Child Ease, Prostagard. Some of this will come in in four weeks, some of it in eight weeks. Okay, so when I tell you we're running out of something, it's not hype. We're going to run out of Survival Shield X2, our best selling product, proprietary deep earth, uh, good halogen, detoxer, energy. You've heard the reviews, it has a 99% third party review rate. We have links to those reviews at InfoWarsLife.com. Do you want to secure your Survival Shield X2? Nason Iodine, now's the time. Super Male, Super Female Vitality are also excellent products. Uh, these are life-changing in my experience and many others. And your purchase supports the broadcast. You're really missing out if you haven't ever tried Super Male or Super Female Vitality. Learn more, see the instructional videos at InfoWarsLife.com. For the four products that are sold out, you can sign up on email there to be the first to get it when it comes in. All right, InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. Okay, AD, I want to get to everybody else, but you brought up some really good points. 30-second response to what our guest said. Uh, Alex, I think basically, to sum it up, the Umbra, which is the handlers of the BIS, are basically going to trigger a global reset, or in other words, a collapse by October. And in order for them to do this, they're going to create some type of mass bio issue or another, you know, vaccine agenda, whatever it's going to be to get us to jump back into the boiling water. We are frogs in the water. The doomsday clock is at five seconds till. I feel this coming. Karen Hughes, she's always on target. Peter Schiff, Jaros, all of them. All your guests are fantastic. I want you to have an InfoWars Summit 30 days long, brother. No, I hear you. We need to do it. We need to have all these guests on. Jim Rogers, who's really smart, says it's going to be spectacular. And you can see the buildup. I mean, maybe it's not going to happen, but I've never seen such pre-buildup. Real fast, a comment to that, then we're going to go to uh, the Dwight, Wild, Jason, and others. Uh, uh, Lionel. You know, we need to have your version of, of Bilderberg. And I always ask people this question. You know, we laugh about that. But imagine if, and you've said this before, imagine if the NFL... Uh, owners met every year secretly since 1954 or Hollywood. That is a beta test to see how will people look the other way. And I think what would be would be great is if we could do a summit, an actual summit. Imagine all of this, all of your guests, all of your your followers and Patriot Bird. Yes, right, indeed. Or but but just to meet, you know, Alex. This is the the question I want people to think about: Is do you think? And this is the bottom line. Do you think that the United States is not susceptible to or is impervious to that which happens elsewhere? Could your pension, your bank account, stocks, your portfolio, your wealth, could it one day disappear? Because secretly, Americans believe that no, it can't because somehow either we're blessed, we're in a city on the hill, that we are immune, we are inoculated. Sure. That this happens elsewhere, but Alex, it's the same playing field. Well, it's, it's like Japan globally. building on a nuclear uh, uh, nuclear plants on a fault line, a tsunami zone, and then lying and saying it's impossible for this to happen. And General Electric went along with it. Uh, it's insanity. I'm going to come right back in 70 seconds and go right to Dwight, then right to Matthew, Jason, Wild, and others. Uh, so just be ready. I'm going to go to each person uh, in order. In fact, it, it's Dwight, Wild, then Matthew. So stay with us. 
We'll be back in 70 seconds with your comment and question. I may just do more overdrive with Lionel. This is you some pretty good radio, GCN. but uh, pretty important stuff to debate. Maybe I'll let this Lionel post the show till 20 after and take calls. Because I've got to go to a meeting. Realize you're behind enemy lines. Your country's been conquered by globalists. Only admitting the full scale allows us to do that. We're going to do a 20 minutes overdrive to get to everybody. In fact, Lionel's going to host the show in the next segment and go to your calls. He's a talk show host in his own right. We're going to take a few calls right now. Dwight in Colorado, you're on the air. Then uh, Wild is next. Go ahead. Hey, how you doing, Alex? This is Dwight calling from, uh, from uh, Denver, Colorado. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good to talk to you, my friend. Thanks for holding. Yeah, I just wanted to start off by saying I love what you guys do. You guys are all true patriots. And uh, it's such a blessing uh, listening to you guys. It's awesome. Well, thank you. My, uh, I wanted to comment on the uh, current financial crisis that's currently taking place in Greece. And my question for you and Lionel is, do you think that this is going to be the filibuster to initiate the uh, one world currency and uh, RFID chipping in every single person? I don't think yet, but clearly they're now just turning everything into Alice in Wonderland uh, by design. What's your take on that, Lionel? Oh, it's happening incrementally, and it's happening by habituation. And as, um, as, uh, as it will be said, uh, successive approximation, which is basically the operant conditioning way of doing it. Little by little, you become used to it. Because as far as the RFID chip goes, it is becoming more and more a part of who we are, and congratulations to you for turning people on to this, the notion of transhumanism. Because what happens is we are going to one day be adorned with all of the jewelry and the accoutrement of our self-imposed prison. And they're going to sell and, it as if it's cool. In fact, shifting gears, oh. what about a New York judge saying, make all the prisoners have chips? Uh, that's convicted. Next, it'll be arrested, just like DNA testing inside their body to track them where they can't even remove the chip. So I guess in the spinal cord or in the brain. And then the governor getting up there like they just won World War II because they caught these two killers when they just let 36,000 violent illegals out. But they make this huge spectacle out of these two guys. It's an example of how the media and the government can decide what to make a big deal. And it also, Alex, started by, remember, at first having your pet chip. And then later on, they're going to say, well, you know, mom and dad who might suffer from dementia will chip them. And then let's get rid of an Amber Alert by chipping your child voluntarily, of course. And then if it's good enough for your dog and mom and dad and your kid, what about you? And then one day, and it's been said a million times, one day when you are found guilty or you are to be removed, nobody needs to physically kill you. They just turn your chip off and you don't exist. That's right. Think Unable to buy and sell. And, and, and they even say in these UN documents and cartoons they've done for British kids to get them ready, there'll be no cars. Those that are will be you know, self-driving for the elite. Very few. You'll get meat once a year. But the computer decides when you get health care. You know, the old bioethicists just killed people saying we're not going to treat them. Now the computer just decides. No, but I want to see And it's this the out. Watson computer, the Nazis. I mean, you can't make it up. But I want to see somebody one day with their smartphone say, wait a minute, Alex, I see you, but it's not picking you up. I don't see that beep. You're not on the 24-7 uh, worldview panopticon. You don't exist. You know, do you uh, believe me or your lying eyes? You will have no significance independent in terms of your flesh. And don't think for a moment, as we get more and more involved in, in 3D apparatuses and virtual, everything from virtual sex to virtual friendship. Oh, they're going to claim we're discriminating uh, by criticizing virtual reality. I, I predict that'll be the new thing, that if you criticize the Second Life type folks that live in La La Land, that you're being hateful to that group. But finish your point when we come back. You're going to have the floor. Dwight, thank you so much. We're going to go to Wild in Wisconsin first, and then we're going to go to Matthew, Jason, and Rich. I've got to go. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming up on the Nightly News tonight, 7 o'clock Central. Lionel will host. I want to thank him for uh, coming up. He'll take four or five phone calls to finish his point. But yes, this is a planned takeover. And it's not Borg from Star Trek, but it might as well be. But instead of just invading us with laser beams and taking over, they're doing it by seducing us with Trojan Horse. 20 past the hour on a variety of subjects. And uh, without further ado, and without any delay, let's go right now to Wild in Wisconsin. Wild, you're on InfoWars on the Alex Jones Show, sir.
How you doing, Lionel? Uh, there's a Serbian Wild. thing that goes in. All right, can you hear me? Wild in Wisconsin. Going can once. Can you hear me now? We're going twice. How about nope. Matthew and said, Matthew, you're on the Alex Jones show. Hello? Yes, sir. Hello. Um, how are you doing today, man? Fine, sir. Matthew, Great. what is on well, your hey, mind? Uh, I just, well, I, what I would like to focus on are root causes of how we got to this point. And I think if we better understand, you know, how we got here, we'd be able to better approach the future and how to change that. Now, there's, um, there's a lady, and her name is Ashley Sanders. Are you familiar with her, with Move to Amend? No, sir. No, well, she's out of Salt Lake City. Well, and um, the thing is, is that she goes off on how uh, corporates, corporations got personhood here in America. Hey, which Matthew, was may I ask a question? Matthew, I yes. don't want to interrupt, and I'm sure she is fantastic, but since I've got you on the phone, may I ask you what your particular ideology is and your particular thoughts, irrespective of somebody else's? What do you think, sir, regarding the problems well, that we face? Well, what I believe is that corporations are not people and money is not speech. And there's, um, you know, that's a big issue in this, you know, today's uh, economy and our and the, the way that, that our policies are being driven up and backdoor deals. And now today it turned into one dollar, one vote rather than what it's supposed to be, you know, rather than what the public needs it to be. And before it used to be a felony for corporations to contribute one penny to uh, political campaigning and all that. Now that just becomes, you know, regular practice. Matthew, and let me ask you a question. Just... Yes, sir. Let me ask you a question if I could, sir. Let's assume that Alex Jones Incorporated were to be a viable, as he is, political movement. And Alex Jones Incorporated wanted to, to, um, to contribute. Don't you think the real answer to get around the Citizens United problem is just disclosure. Let a corporation donate. Let a corporation involve itself in the system. But let's find out who the corporation is and how much they're actually contributing. Do you think that's a way around it? Right. Maybe maybe open books. But you know that's the that's the thing. It's like, well, we could go ahead and ask for disclosure, but we're only going to be told so much. You know what and. The thing is, is that if there was complete transparency, like there, I mean, at one point within the first 75 years of this country, you had to actually go to be able to get incorporated. You had to go down to your, to your local senators and actually convince them how your business was going to benefit the well, public. Matthew, Matthew, my friend, you make some excellent points. I certainly thank you for your call. Let's go right now to uh, Jason who's calling. Jason, you're on the Alex Jones show. Jason. How about Rich? Rich, are you there, sir? You're on the Alex Jones Show. Yeah, how you doing, Lyle? I'm Good really PO'd, man. And what I want to know is this. This is treason, plain and simple, across right. the board. Uh, TPP, all the things that have been going on, these documents, if they were revealed, they're treasonous. And the people do, who are letting it happen are abetting treason. I don't understand why. Why a department, isn't there any department, for example, the sheriff's department has more power in the state than the president does, okay? And they can deputize where they need to deputize when they can't handle a situation that's beyond their singular mean. Uh, why can't this happen? Why can't we arrest these people like we did in the good old days? Arrest these people, try them, and, and, and find them guilty of treason. That's what this is. And it just keeps going on. And I don't understand why. I, don't well, I appreciate why that. No but, the, but the problem that exists is that if you were to try to do that, you were to say, okay, let us argue. Let us go and declare this to be unconstitutional. Let's try to get the Supreme Court to grant us certiorari. Let us bring a case against the government saying that this is a violation of the treaties provision or some particular aspect of the Constitution. The Supreme Court then grants certiorari or the right of review. But something tells me that the Supreme Court, based upon the current framework, is going to merely say, this is within the province of the legislature. This is within the province of the president. This is within the realm of possibilities of legislation. And even though you may not agree with it, what your remedy is, is to kick somebody out of office.
This is a political question. You know, the word treason is something which is a fascinating subject. The idea to me that something is so reprehensible, so, so contrary to the rudiments of this country and to the bases of this constitution, I would venture to say that that word means virtually nothing today. The thing that I don't understand, and this is the part that I have talked to Alex about and, and others as well, is that there was a time when we as the United States were the only game in town. And we thought about what really affected us. What was it that affected us and our way of thinking and our livelihood? Did it pre present a clear and present danger to us? Not something theoretical. Because ask yourself, what was the last engagement, the last war, the last military action that we ever got involved in that dealt with a real and true threat to this country? Something that was direct and absolute. I'm still waiting. You know, I was here on that terrible day in uh, 2001, on September the 11th, and I was here, and I remember, I remember how I felt, and I remember at the time how being a part of this, and the smell, and the sound, and the attitude that lingered in New York, and I remember at the time thinking, I don't care who was responsible for this, I wanted to get them. And I'll never forget this because now I look back and I say it almost, um, I'm almost ashamed of what I thought because I, I was so angry. And it didn't really matter who was involved, whether Afghanistan was involved or whether or Iraq, it didn't matter to me. And then after the fact, after the smoke cleared, literally and actually, after I started to read and after I awakened and woke up and saw what was going on, I realized that I had this particular piece of terror used as a fulcrum, as a wedge. It was used against me to lure me into going along and just signing off on this. And then little by little, I found out that these people, these countries that were allegedly responsible for this horror that I saw and felt and experienced, that Afghanistan, lo and behold, happened to be the Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia rather, of lithium. Isn't that amazing? And that all of these countries that miraculously were involved somehow tangentially or theoretically with 9-11, all of them had tremendous assets that other people wanted. And the great Gerald Salenti said it best. And at that time he said, and still does, what do you think the chances of us ever involving or invading Iraq if they, if their major export was broccoli? And little by little, I realized, oh my God. And from that moment on, I'll never forget this. Something happened to me and it's happened to you as well. And Alex, in many respects, was responsible for turning my ignition switch on, of making me aware of what's going on. You know, you talk about what's treasonous. I see right now something that is very easy for people to understand, very easy. And it's this wonderful thing called the Bill of Rights, this wonderful aspect of the Constitution. And people will argue whether they have a, a bead on what it is or not, whether they really truly understand it. And I am seeing the First Amendment and the Second Amendment for sure. The Third Amendment, we haven't had much of a problem with that, quartering soldiers at your home against your will. But Fourth Amendment search and seizure and Fifth Amendment in due process, all of them are systematically being eroded, little by little, bit by bit. And if all is said and done, when we look back on this wonderful civilization of ours, this is going to be the thing that changed everything. I always ask this, and I want you to think about this, and I appreciate Alex allowing me the chance to do this. But I want you to imagine if you could meet Hamilton or Jefferson or Madison today, or George Orwell, Mr. Blair, and you could have a conversation with them. What would you tell them? What would freak them out? What would rock their world? And if ever I met Eric Blair, uh, George Orwell, I would say, remember how you wrote 1984 and you envisioned the enemy being the state, kind of Stasi-like. Will you imagine the state and the secret police breaking in and leaving a microphone next to the 
wall socket or next to the coffee maker. Remember when you imagine the government actively surveilling us by breaking in and breaking the curtilage, as we lawyers refer to the area around your home. Well, this changed everything. Because what we did when we signed on to this, we accepted its, its irresponsibility, so to speak. And whenever we had a new app, or we wanted to be known, and we wanted to use GPS, and we wanted to have these things, these, these wonderful little tools and gadgets and gizmos, we signed on. And we took the Fourth Amendment and we gave it away. That's what I would say. Well, on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you. To Alex Jones, thank you. And to his tremendous staff, thank you as well. I am so honored to be a part of this. Follow me on Twitter at Lionel Media, and I hope to be with you again as soon as possible. Thank you so much.